everyone, and welcome to today's seminar on gender and informal cross-border trade. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a knowledge management specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And um, I'm happy to serve as host and facilitator on behalf of Microlinks and Agrolinks today. Microlinks and Agrolinks are both USA technical knowledge sharing platforms implemented by the Feed the Future KDAD project. And they have a lot of um, crossover material, I think, that uh, the webinars and seminars and events that are relevant to one are often very relevant to the other. So if you are a member of Microlinks or Agrolinks, I highly suggest uh, signing up for the mailing list of the other one and making sure that you kind of get, get on our list and get notified of uh, various events, seminars, and the like. Uh, before we get started with the content, I just wanted to go through a couple of our usual housekeeping issues. First, we always remind everyone to please silence your cell phones so that we don't interrupt the speakers. Second, uh, this seminar is being recorded. And by virtue of signing up today by uh, registering your email either out front or by registering for the webinar, you will get an email uh, in about a week or so with the post-event recording, uh, transcript, and any other resources uh, that are important to share. Um, lastly, we generally ask that people hold their questions until the end of the presentations. Uh, one will be passing around this microphone uh, for everyone to be able to ask your questions. This will help our webinar audience uh, to be able to hear your questions. And I'd also like to give a shout out to our webinar audience today. Uh, we always have a, a pretty sizable crowd joining from around the world, so that's exciting. Later, we'll ask for an update on how many people are joined via webinar. All right, so it's time to dive into our content. I'm going to introduce our introducer of sorts. I'll introduce Sate, who will then introduce our, uh, our main speaker, uh, Liz Myers. So Sate Mboop is a Foreign Service Officer at USAID. He serves as an economist and most recently completed a tour at USAID's regional office in Bangkok. During that tour, he managed uh, the USG's economic growth portfolio in Laos. In his current DC assignment, he works on a multi-donor public-private partnership that focuses on promotion of the trade facilitation agreement of the WTO. He also serves as USAID's liaison to the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is the US government's other development agency. So Sate, please take the mic and give us your introduction. First of all, here's my bio. You can read it later again if you want. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming uh, to this presentation on International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day. I'm glad we didn't have a no women protest here. That would have been awkward. Um, so thanks for showing up. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, gender and informal trade. And I'm just here to set a little bit of context from a USAID perspective on why this is important and why we're paying close attention to it. Um, so why does gender matter to trade? Um, well, the goal of trade liberalization is to create more jobs for women and men. Um, and trade theory suggests that economies should focus on their comparative advantage. But what if the industries that governments and donors decide to focus on are male dominated? For instance, what if in a country mining is uh, just as effective economically as, for instance, services? Um, do we look at the gender impact of focusing on those different industries? Um, so if we're not paying attention to these issues, trade may actually exacerbate some of these gaps to, um, uh, in economic growth between men and women. The measurable economic benefits of gender equality are palpable. And in the United States alone, women-owned firms have an economic impact of $3 trillion. And tr that translates to about 27% uh, of all US jobs. And from a developing country perspective in India, only 27% of, of women work. And that leaves out 420 million people that could be adding value to the economy. So the gaps are pretty big. And um, that's why we pay attention. To, that's one of the reasons why we pay attention to these issues. But going in to think a little bit more uh, about why specifically, um, you know, from a business perspective, uh, the case is obvious. The International Labor Organization estimates that women occupy 70 to 80 percent of the 27 million jobs in the export processing zones globally. 
And the World Economic Forum has done some research and found that companies with top quartile representation of women in executive positions perform better than companies with no women at the top. Another statistic that kind of surprised me was uh, a McKinsey study that stated that the full potential scenario of bridging the gender gap is an additional $28 trillion of annual GDP. And for context, current global GDP is $78 trillion. So that's not a trivial amount. That's uh, something that could uh, really revolutionize the world economy. Another statistic that surprised me is if all countries match their best in-country gender parity, $12 trillion could be added to global GDP. That's kind of a confusing statistic, but basically what it means is that if in a country like Ghana, for instance, if they were able to achieve gender parity in the whole country um, as much as they have achieved in Accra, uh, and if the whole world did that, we would see an estimated $12 trillion of annual GDP um, increased. And for context, we're going to be talking about Southern Africa later today. Um, informal cross-border trade in that region alone is worth 17 to 20 billion. So these are pretty big numbers. Um, in terms of the development case, I, I don't think I need to tell you folks in the room here that there is a pretty strong linkage between greater gender equality and economic performance. Um, you know, increased labor force participation rates and entrepreneurship from women leads to income generation, employment, and slower population growth. And most developing countries, a higher proportion of female-headed households live in poverty than those headed by men. And so higher participation rates in, uh, in the economy by women and in trade by women uh, has a broader distribution effect. And then, of course, there's a human rights case, but we don't need to uh, belabor that point. Um, gender is a basic universal goal that's enshrined in whichever uh, international instrument you want to look at, Charter of the United Nations, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so beyond this, USAID, at USAID we like to look at the gender question um, from a trade perspective with three lenses. What's going on behind the border, what's going on at the border, and what's going on beyond the border. So behind the border, we all know that women and men experience access to markets quite differently. Um, we don't necessarily uh, pay as much attention to that as we should. But when you look at issues like labor markets, um, it's harder for women to enter into the formal sector than it is for men, for reasons we'll go into more later on today. Just from an education perspective, from a training perspective, from workforce development, men just have more opportunities than women do. Um, from a financial perspective, just access to finance alone. I listed uh, USAID's digital lab here because we're doing a lot of work on access to finance and we, we think it has the uh, potential to significantly affect um, women's ability to do business. And then when you think about things like access to markets for goods and services, just for women to get the inputs to produce electricity, um, for women in some countries to get people to come and hook up their business to the electric lines sometimes is difficult. Um, another, something that I read that really kind of blew my mind and uh, made me think a little bit more carefully about how women and men experience markets differently is that procedures discriminate against women. Female-owned enterprises do not report a higher burden from regulations than those owned by men. However, this changes when it comes to procedural obstacles which require personal interaction between firm managers and officials. So if we're advocating for policies um, that require you know, women to go and collect X, Y, and Z document from a ministry, that's adding an interaction that wasn't there before and that potentially makes it harder for women um, uh, to get, get things done. And then we look at what's happening at the border. And the first question that you want to know is, which border? As we'll see, that question is relevant. Um, are we talking about a, a, an official border? Are we talking about a line that's drawn on a map where people are cro crossing in the bushes? Can women physically get to and through the border? What if all border personnel are men? 
Um, I lived in West Africa when I was younger. My father and mother worked there. And I remember one time, we, my mother and I were crossing a border from Ghana to Togo. And, you know, we were fortunate. My, you know, we were driving a car with diplomatic license plates, and we were just trying to get across. And a customs official was asking for documents from my mother. And she, you know, had her, um, had her purse, and she was fumbling, and she handed the documents to him with her left hand. And he wouldn't take it. And he wouldn't even look at her because that was a sign of disrespect. Uh, and my mother was seething at this. And for the rest of the day, she was just so upset. And you know, this is just us trying to get from one part of the border to the other. What about women that have goods? What about women that have no rights? Um, that, so that was a telling moment for me as a child and uh, has made me sort of pay closer attention to this issue in, in life in general. Um, what about public services and security? Are there toilets? Um, and are they in safe areas? Are women less likely to try to cross a formal border if they don't have these facilities and have to uh, protect themselves from, um, from potential predators? Transaction costs and wait times. Does it take longer for women to do business? Probably. Are they less likely to trade if they know that they're going to be held up? Probably. And then beyond the border, um, you know, this has a lot to do with some of the you know, the elements of trade policy that can be leveraged to integrate priorities of gender equality and women's economic empowerment. Um, and one example that I really like that the World Bank is implementing in um, Eastern and Southern Africa is called the Charter for Cross-Border Trade in Goods and Services, where they find their codes of conduct at those borders and they build upon them, um, and specifically working in ministries of in, Zamb of Zamb in Zambia and Malawi working at that specific border. And they're targeting informal traders and trying to make it easier for them to trade. And the basic principles of this charter are to reduce abuse and sexual harassment, um, to promote efficient processing and, and uh, reduce discrimination, and to have transparent duties, fees, and taxes, and to reduce bribe payment, and to um, have clear documentary requirement. Just because a lot of the women that we're dealing with here are are not literate, and having clear signage mm -hmm. posted on, on a wall that um, might um, uh, more effectively get a point across is, is a, an important endeavor. It also introduces a credible complaint mechanism based on toll-free lines, and I'm eager to go back to the World Bank and um, see whether those toll-free lines are still in operation, because this was a couple of years ago, and uh, I've been meaning to follow up with them. And it also introduces a performance measurement system with context tailored indicators. So um, just as I wrap up, I wanted to let you all know about um, USAID's policy and guidance that's available to folks that are programming in this area. Um, our ADS is sort of our internal um, guidelines that are publicly available as well that you can look at that um, uh, might give you some interesting ideas and guidance. We've also got a number of toolkits that I think that um, people should try to look at, and I think Kata is going to make that available to folks. Um, so please take a look at that when you get a chance. And then, of course, we've got um, uh, we've got studies that people like Liz Myers has done, uh, the Women's Cross-Border Trade in Southern Africa, which is the paper that we're here to hear about today, um, is an example of research that uh, I think could be beneficial to folks, which is why we're having this event. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Liz Myers, um, who has been known as my professional BFF. Uh, she's done this really great research, and we're really happy to have her here. We're lucky to have her here. She's a senior gender specialist at Banyan Global, and she's got expertise in integrating gender into economic growth, trade, and agriculture sectors. She's designed and led research on women and informal cross-border trade, uh, child, early, and forced marriage um, issues, social norms, women's financial inclusion, micro work, impact sourcing, and numerous gender analyses and assessments. Uh, this work that she did was uh, for a USAID project in the Southern Africa Trade Hub, and we're uh, really excited to hear from you, Liz.
are part of the project. Looks at the informal sector cross. Border traders who are overwhelmingly. Women, these women are not only earning a living, they are controlling the. Income. There are positives at both the personal level and also the national level. Informal cross border trade exceeds. in volume formal trade that contributes to food security in the region and it contributes it's to regional peace as well because you have trade rather than conflict In almost all of the countries that have been studied, the women are found to have a consequential going to bring it in really narrow and, and start there. So this is Ms. A. Ms. A is a single mother. She runs a household of seven. She has three children aged four, 10, and 12. And she's also responsible for providing for three siblings. Her mother, who is now deceased, was an informal cross-border trader. And she taught Ms. A the business. She taught Ms. A everything she knows about informal cross-border trade. Ms. A lives in Kasani, Botswana, and she trades at the Kazangula Ferry Border Post, which we actually just saw in that video, the crossing by water. And that's a border post to Zambia. She also trades at the Nagoma Land Border Post to Namibia and the Martinsdraft Border Post to South Africa. She also operates a temporary market stall at the Kasani Market. She generally works seven days a week, very early in the morning to sundown. During the summer, her, her schedule is actually quite seasonal. So during the summer, she wakes up at 4.30 in the morning. She prepares food for her children. She gets in line at the Zambia border. And she gets in line before it opens at 6 in the morning. She then crosses the border to barter for vegetables from Zambian farmers who live about 10 kilometers from the border. She will carry groceries um, and then exchange them for sweet potatoes, for broccoli, for ground nuts, and for sugar beans. And then she brings all these, um, these agricultural products back to Botswana, where she sells them at her market stall in Kasani for the rest of the day. Typically, she gets back across the border at noon and then sells for the rest of the day. During the winter, however, she has a different schedule. She typically goes to Lusaka, Zambia about three times a month and spends five or six days away at a time carrying groceries to and across the border, which she then barters for secondhand clothes. She says that the clothing business is more lucrative, and it's especially more lucrative during the winter. So that's why her schedule changes when it's in the winter. She says in months of high turnover, she makes about 3,000 pula a month, which is $278. And she has sent her two older children and her three brothers to school using the money from her business. And she also uses her income to pay for rent, to pay for household needs as well as supporting maternal un uncles and cousins. So she's supporting a lot of people with this income. She says that in general, the community respects her livelihood, and they see her as successful and professional. And because she's able to provide for her family, because she's respected as a businesswoman, she plans on being an informal cross-border trader for the rest of her life. 
However, Ms. A was very quick to point out that she experiences a grave number of constraints in her day-to-day -day business. She talked about high duties and taxes. She talked about fluctuating value of the commodities that she barters. It's hard to understand what the current value of what she's trading for is. There are long lines at the border. She experiences a lack of working capital. She's been unable to access formal financing. And in the summer, she says long waits at the border mean that her vegetables from Zambia are often ruined in the sun. But she also said that while she feels empowered by her work and she can provide for her family, she's concerned, she's concerned about how much time she spends away from her children. And she finds it very difficult to be a working single mother. I'm sure this is something that women in the United States also encounter on International Women's Day. Um, and so this is Ms. A. Just, this isn't the life of one informal cross-border trader that we encounter in our research. And now zooming back out, we'll t I'll frame the research a little bit more before I go into some of our research findings. So what we wanted to do from our research is we wanted to better highlight and understand the contributions that women and formal cross-border traders make to trade and to local, national, and regional economies. We also wanted to better understand the constraints and challenges experienced by informal cross-border traders. And then while in understanding opportunities and constraints and challenges, be able to identify practical, evidence-based solutions to address these constraints and challenges. And finally, we wanted to create some key learning and information disseminating tools, including the video we just shared, as well as a three-page fact sheet on women informal cross-border traders. Now looking at the methodology we used, and here is a great map of the Southern Africa region, and you can see these are the two border posts where we did research. We, um, this, this assessment came about at the very end of the USAID Southern Africa Trade Hub project. We were integrating gender uh, throughout the lifetime of the project, and we finally got approval to do this assessment towards the end, and it was originally envisioned to be a slightly longer a uh, slightly longer assessment involving more places of field work, but because the project was coming to a close, we very much had to do it as a rapid gender assessment. And so I think that's important to frame the research. This wasn't a quantitative study. It was very much a qualitative rapid assessment. But what we wanted it to do was we wanted it to lay a strong foundation for the follow-on USAID project, which is the Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub, which is now being implemented and spark a conversation and hopefully inspire further investment on this issue. And I think the fact that we were invited here today by USAID to present on this research so shows that this is a priority to USAID and the conversation is continuing. But we very much wanted this research to be the tip of the iceberg, not the iceberg itself. We had a two-person research team including an international gender specialist and a regional-based um, ICBT expert who's based in Zimbabwe and has done a lot of the leading research in Southern Africa on informal cross-border trade. We started with an extensive policy and desk review where we consulted over 45 qualitative and quantitative literature resources. And we also reviewed policies developed by regional economic communities in Southern Africa, including COMESA, SADC, SACU, and then considered the implications of how such policies might affect women in formal cross-border traders. And then we capped that off with research at two borders, the Mwanza border post in Malawi and the Kazangula border post in Botswana. That's the border you saw in the video. We interviewed 36 informal cross-border traders, 26 women and 10 men through focus group discussions and key informant interviews. And then we also did key informant interviews with some insiders including cross-border trade association members and customs, immigration, and police officers at the borders. So starting with the discussion on ICBT in the African context, we found that informal cross-border trade is incredibly fluid. It's also highly efficient when compared with formal trade in Africa. So for example, in Africa, uh, it experiences the average custom delays of 12.1 days for formal trade. That's the largest and that's the longest delay in the world. In contrast, customs officials in Malawi and Botswana were observing a line of informal cross-border traders waiting to cross the border, and they told our research team that they would all make it through in about several hours. So 12.1 days, several hours. 
It's also incredibly widespread. For example, a 2009 African Development Bank study on ICBT estimated that informal cross-border trade provides an income source for 43% of Africa's population. So 43% of Africa's population is getting some type of income source from informal cross-border trade. Now let's look at women's role in informal cross-border trade. And it's audience participation time, I think specifically for the people in the room, sorry for the people on the webinar, but does anyone have a guess at the estimated percentage of women ICBTs in Sub-Saharan Africa? Raise your hand if you have a guess. What percentage of informal cross-border traders in Africa are women? Can I get an answer? 90, we hear, someone said 80. Okay, yes, so studies by UN Women, COMESA, and other sources estimate that women comprise 70 to 80% of informal cross-border traders. So I think it's, it's pretty easy to make the case why we need to do research on women and informal cross-border trade. Then we sought to better understand the profile of women in formal cross-border trade. Who are these women that are without borders and are constantly crossing borders to trade? We found, looking at education, that contrary to stereotypes, women ICBTs are not undereducated. Desk research and fieldwork found that most ICBTs have some secondary education. For example, 82% of the Malawi women ICBTs we interviewed had at least secondary or higher education. In the past, informal cross-border trade was seen largely as an economic coping mechanism. It was seen as an option for the less educated. However, economic hardships in the region have served as a significant push factor for many people of all education levels to engage in ICBT. We also looked at marriage and fertility and found that many of the women included in our field research were heads of their own households either because they were not married, they were widowed, they were divorced, they were separated, or because their husbands had jobs in other locations and they were acting as de facto heads of households. Women had on average about two children, but they often had many additional dependents, including children of deceased family members. For many, being an informal cross-border trader was not their only job. Many had other formal or informal jobs. And many of the women included in the field work were also retailers. They sold the goods they trade. They sell the goods they bring back directly in shops, in formal and informal markets, from their homes or through their other jobs. So then looking at some of the commodities that women in formal cross-border traders sell. We found that women are highly involved in selling agricultural commodities across borders. But they're also selling manufactured goods, cloth, textiles, apparel, accessories, as well as cosmetics, kitchen and cooking appliances, electronic appliances, and handicrafts. And we found that they're pretty flexible and entrepreneurial in the commodities that they sell. And they'll typically add or change commodities that they're selling or bartering in response to a sudden opportunity or a shift in supply and demand patterns. So they're really adaptable in what they're selling and how they're selling. We did find an interesting gender difference in terms of commodities in Malawi, whereas women informal cross-border traders typically operate at a smaller scale than their male counterparts, with, ma with male ICBTs more likely to deal in electronics and high quality manufactured goods. So we did find in Malawi this gender difference in commodities as well. Now looking at the contributions that informal cross-border trade has in the lives of these women, we found that women traders, regardless of their marital status, control their own businesses and are generally able to make decision-making control over the incomes derived from informal cross-border trade. And this is no small feat in the sub-Saharan African context. And women informal cross-border traders said that they generally feel that because they're earning an income from their trade activities, that they have increased decision-making capacity within the household and within their family because they were bringing in money. All informal cross-border traders that we interviewed said that informal cross-border trade helps them provide for the basics of their household. And almost all the women included in fieldwork said that they used ICBT earnings to pay for their children's school fees. 
So again, a link between trade and economic growth and education. And more general research has found that women's economic empowerment can have very significant contributions in family health, family nutrition, food security, and housing. And so I think it's pretty easy to make the case that all of the income from informal cross-border trade are also having impacts on health, nutrition, food security, and housing in the families of women informal cross-border traders. We also found that ICBT had really important effects on women's self-esteem. Women saw themselves as economic agents, and they were really proud of this role. They also said that, in general, they were respected within their communities and their households for being able to engage in trade and bring in incomes and support their families. So now, expanding outward, we're going to look more at the national and regional level. And we found that research by the United Nations found that ICBT can contribute between 30 to 40% of intrastatic trade. That's a huge statistic. So ICBT can contribute between 30 to 40% of intrastatic trade. And some research estimates that on average 60% of Africa's trade is informal. It also contributes, uh, informal cross-border trade contributes to government revenues via duties, licenses, and passport fees. And ICBT in Southern Africa is valued at $20 billion a year. And it can also be used, seen as a coping and a resilience mechanism for unemployment and underemployment in the region. It offers flexible working conditions and a supplementary source of income. As I mentioned, many informal cross-border traders had other jobs. So this is an additional way to bring an income into the household. We also had an interesting finding at the Mwanza border post uh, where the uh, we talked to some police at the police station, and they said that they feel like in that area, ICBT actually helps reduce criminal activity given the high unemployment rates because it does provide another economic opportunity for people who otherwise wouldn't have a job and could resort to criminality. Looking at food security, we found that ICBT plays a crucial role in food security as informal cross-border traders typically trade from areas of surplus to shortage. Research from the African Development Bank found that between 2005 and 2006, when many countries in the region were experiencing critical food shortages, over 200,000 metric tons of foodstuff were traded informally during the year, and that helped lessen the impact of the food crisis. We also found that the fluidity and the exchange across borders and amongst populations and groups can also promote peace building and conflict mitigation. So I've talked a lot about the benefits in informal cross-border trade, but we need to have a serious conversation about the constraints that informal cross-border traders, specifically women, encounter on a daily basis. And so I'm going to go over a number of these constraints. And I don't have notes on any of these constraints on my PowerPoint, so you're just going to have to listen to me. So <laughs> no side for now. So while the free trade area uh, has helped ease border taxes in the Comesa region, there are still a range of taxes and charges, many of which are quite costly for traders. And because there are all these duties and fees to pay, this will often spur non-payment of taxes and duties or lead to under-declaring of goods, which definitely leads to a lot of tension between informal cross-border traders and border officials. The traders we spoke to also complained about inadequate access to finance and financial resources and said that this was a chronic problem. According to research by Comesa, 80% of ICBTs can only obtain capital from in informal sources, such as rotating savings clubs in their communities. Only one-fifth of traders had access to bank loans, and 62% of these were men. So men, male traders are finding it much easier to access formal financing. We found two main reasons for this lack of formal credit. One is that women traders rarely have the collateral required by the banks. They're not, they don't own their land. They don't own their property. And two, we found that the seasonal and fluctuating income flow, as I mentioned, you know, Miss A does very different jobs and has very different patterns of work in the summers and the winters. And this makes it difficult for women to use standardized loan pro 
products that require regular payments. They need something much more tailored and, uh, to their se the seasonal nature of their work. Information and awareness was also found to be a critical constraint. And this was a key finding from our research that there is an enormous information gap between informal cross-border traders and border agents. There it was, we, our researchers observed a clear lack of posted customs rules and regulations at all the borders they visited. And the information that was available was not clear. In addition, as State mentioned, it's often not available in local languages and that this can be pretty problematic for those with limited education, limited language fluencies, or those who are illiterate. Many of the Malawi Revenue Authorities uh, officials that we spoke to insisted that the customs rules and regulations are clear. They insisted this. But the informal cross-border traders that we spoke to said that, the, no, the rules and regulations are not clear to them, and they complained about being harassed and cheated and overcharged by the Malawi Revenue Authority officials. So clearly there is a disconnect between what the Malawi Revenue Authorities think and what the informal cross-border traders know. We also found that informal cross-border traders misunderstand many of the rules and regulations. So for example, Malawi, they, there's a duty exemption of 300,000 kwacha for people who have been out of the country for 48 hours and are bringing back goods for personal use. However, many informal cross-border traders believe that the regulation also applies to goods for businesses purposes, business purposes. So they feel cheated when they're not given the exemption. Clearly they misunderstand the rule, but that's leading to a lot of tension and resentment between the informal cross-border traders and the border agents. We also found that informal cross-border traders primarily depend on their own networks for information. They're not getting the information from formal sources. Looking at infrastructure, and this was also something that State highlighted in his introduction, we found that there is a dearth of affordable and safe accommodation for women who have to stay overnight at the borders. Many women sleep out in the open or in crowded dormitories. We also found that border posts lack decent storage facilities or waiting areas to help protect their goods. They'll stand in line for hours in the heat or the rain with no shelter, and this can ruin the goods they've just crossed the border to sell and uh, trade or barter for. And this can also reduce profit margins for the traders, and it can also lead to some hygiene and health issues if they are actually selling damaged goods. We also found that there was an absence of banking facilities at the borders and that traders often have to travel to nearby towns to withdraw funds to pay duties and taxes, adding to the time it takes to engage in cross-border trade. Looking at transportation, we found that transportation is unorganized, undependable, and unsafe. A study by UN Women found that women ICBTs often experience theft of cash or goods on different forms of public, of public transportation to and from the borders, as well as sexual harassment. The Botswana ICBTs that we interviewed also complained about reckless and drunken bus and truck drivers and frequent accidents. Now looking at corruption, a Comesa 2012 study found that more than 60% of women and formal cross-border traders complained of significant corruption by officials seeking to extort bribes and kickbacks. And that this is a common practice to prevent goods from being confiscated at borders. At the Mwanza border in Malawi, we had both male and female informal cross-border traders and immigration officers saying that the border police in Mozambique will commonly seize the passports of Malawians and then request bribes to return them. So we actually had customs officials of one border saying that the corruption was happening at the other border. I know a pretty serious finding and, and a very disheartening one, especially on International Women's Day, was the high rates of gender-based violence that women in formal cross-border tra traders encounter on a practically daily basis. Both the literature and the Malawi fieldwork found that gender-based violence, including sexual harassment, sexual coercion, and sexual exploitation is widely pervasive at borders and while in transit to and from borders. Border agents, Maybe instead of asking for a kickback or a bribe, we'll demand sexual favors in lieu of that bribe or in lieu, for, in, in lieu of not confiscating goods. 
And all of the Malawi focus group participants that we included in our research said that this was common at the Mwanza border in Mozambique, with Mozambique. We also found that overcrowded accommodation, as I mentioned, women are often staying in these crowded dormitories, as well as overcrowded market, marketing facilities can also lead to gender-based violence, often by male police officers, by thieves, as well as other traders. A UN women's study found that 20% of informal cross-border traders who slept out in the open experienced some form of gender-based violence. 18% of those who slept in crowded dormitories also experienced gender-based violence. Those are pretty high statistics. We also found that women experienced sexual, verbal, and physical harassment from transport operators. And in general, women ICBTs have very little rec recourse when they experience gender-based violence. And overall, and this is incredibly depressing, that sexual exploitation, coercion, and harassment are just accepted to be a reality amongst informal cross-border traders. And some are adopting a, a harmful coping mechanism to give them a little bit more leverage in these situations. So focus group participants described how some women will cultivate a girlfriend-boyfriend relationship with border agents because this will give her some space to negotiate the where, the when, and the what, and especially the with whom in that sexual encounter. So one woman told researchers that if she's known to be in a girlfriend-boyfriend relationship with Officer X, his colleague and co-worker, Officer Y, will be less likely to force her to engage in, a, in any sort of sexual act. So this is a way to protect themselves from other forms of gender-based violence. I'm going to talk about another case study just to reiterate this point on gender-based violence in the, role, in the lives of informal cross-border traders. And I'm going to highlight what Ms. B told us. So Ms. B is from Lalongwe. She has a tertiary diploma in business management, and she's been in business since she was a teenager. She actually became a model and started her own modeling agency in Lalongwe. And then to facilitate her business, she began transporting cosmetics, clothes, and shoes from South Africa. Other women began admiring her look, and she recognized that this was a business opportunity and began selling these products within Malawi. Initially, informal cross-border trade and, tra and trading these projects and products and selling them was a sideline business, but it became quite profitable and high demand in its own right. So she solidified her business relationships with different suppliers in South Africa, and she became a regular cross-border trader. And since then, she's expanded to a wide range of other project products as her customers have begun to request groceries, cooking products, phones, TVs, and even refrigerators. So she's now trading a ton of other goods in addition to these clothes and shoes and makeup. She said that each new item requires new learning and how to get it across the border. And she also said that her trading business very quickly overcame her modeling business, and that's her primary source of income right now. She said that overall, she makes a good living in her trade business, and this allows her to provide for her daughter, and she's also well-respected for her work. Miss B uses a small border crossing at Mulanji, as she says that this is the best crossing to get her goods across easily. When asked a little bit further about how she can get her goods across the border at Mulanji, she said that she's developed friendships with the different border agents, and th these friendships do come at a high personal cost. She indicated that she frequently experiences sexual harassment from the border agents who request or require sexual favors in order to let her get through with her goods. And she indicated that she typically complies with these requests, and she saw this form of sexual-based exploitation and gender-based violence as a necessary cost of doing business and a trade-off for the economic success of her business. She indicated that if she has to provide sexual acts to get her goods across, it was better to do it someone on her own terms. So consequently, she had a customs boyfriend, but said she was constantly work walking this tightrope in negotiating their relationship and sexual encounters. And that was really quite challenging. So let's be clear. This is still gender-based violence. It's a coping strategy, and it's a means to assert just a little bit more agency in a bad situation, but it is by no means a solution to gender-based violence. We also found, the UN Women's Study found, that some informal cross-border traders will also trade sex for safe accommodation. As I mentioned before, if 18% of informal cross-border traders are experiencing gender-based violence in these dormitories, some women are saying, okay, well, I might as well pick the person I'm engaging in a sexual encounter 
to have safer accommodation if there's such a high risk in staying in these dormitories. We also found that gender-based violence at the borders has some pretty negative consequences on how some women in formal cross-border traders are perceived within communities. And as a result of these high rates of sexual exploitation and coercion, some women traders have to deal with the perception that they're promiscuous or sex workers. So there's this backlash on women for having to deal with gender-based violence. Looking at health as a constraint, we found that the lack of infrastructure at borders, including unhealthy water, sanitation, um, and lack of nutritious and you know, hygienic food options can have some serious health implications. There's also high risk of malaria exposure at these borders, especially when you, the, the fact that there is just a lack of accommodation and most of the available accommodation does not have mosquito nets. Women and formal cross-border traders travel long distances with heavy loads, often on foot or in cramped, overheated buses and trucks. And then they send, spend several hours waiting in long lines in the sun and the rain. And you know what? They do this while pregnant, too. And so that obviously can have some pretty serious health risks and consequences as well. Women also said that the, there was just not much food available at the border that was nutritious, that was hygienic. And they complained of having a lot of health, negative health effects, like diarrhea and ulceration problems because of the food available at borders. Women in uh, ICBT are also at serious risk of contracting STIs and HIV AIDS, uh, especially due to the high rates of sexual harassment and gender-based violence at the borders and in transit to and from borders. And that's just contributing to these risks. And in addition, long-haul truck drivers are also classified as high risk groups for HIV AIDS and women in formal cross-border traders are frequently interacting with them as well. The last constraint I'm going to highlight I found is, is pretty surprising actually. And we found that when informal cross-border traders feel overwhelmed by the border challenges that I just talked about, when it just seems like too much for them to deal with, they sometimes resort to informal bush border crossings that are often pretty high risk in their own right. In northern Botswana, informal cross-border traders from Zambia and Zimbabwe will often bypass the formal borders to, get, to try to avoid a lot of the constraints I just highlighted, and they'll utilize informal crossings that also happen to be wild animal corridors. So at, in these wild animal corridors, there are large predators, including lions and hyenas, as well as dangerous elephants, and that also exposes informal cross-border traders to a pretty serious risk. We also found that informal cross-border traders are more likely to use these corridors at night to avoid being seen and reported by other people, but that also significantly adds to their risk. So a lot of, a lot of these women are putting themselves at risk by using these informal border crossings because they want to, they're so desperate to avoid some of these other constraints that I mentioned. But I'm going to end on a more positive note and talk about some of the recommendations and opportunities. And I encourage everyone to visit the report, which I think is now online on AgriLinks and MicroLinks. And the report has a recommendations section at the end. And it also goes into a lot more detail on all the constraints I just highlighted. So one recommendation was to address infrastructure challenges in the areas of transportation, health, and border facilities. So we recommend forming private, public and private sector partnerships to provide better storage facilities, adequate accommodation, water and sanitation, banking facilities, and a lot of the other infrastructure-based constraints. We also felt it was important to fulfill ICBT's right to information by clearly posting information on regional trade agreements and protocols and specific rules and on regulations on each border in, in places that are clear and easily accessible and in, way, in, in, in ways that are easily digestible to women with limited education, li limited literacy. We also felt it was important to make paper copies available and make sure that information is translated into local languages. We also felt that it was important to, to support stronger communication with informal cross-border traders and trade officials, particularly border agents. Throughout my presentation, I've highlighted how there's just a disconnect and a breakdown in dialogue and communication and understanding between informal cross-border traders on one hand and then the, tra the trade and border officials that they're interacting with on a daily basis on the other hand. We want to promote stronger communication and dialogues, reduce knowledge gaps, promote better understanding of relevant policies, 
and to reduce opportunities from, for bribe seeking. We also think it's important to build this dialogue to help reduce misperceptions, reduce tension, and reduce miscommunication because our research found that there's just a lot of tension between the informal cross-border traders and the border officials at the front lines. And we thought this, in particular, was a significant opportunity for the Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub, as well as any other projects that are working directly with border agents. If you already have a working relationship with border agents, like the, the Southern Africa Trade Hub, the, the past product had created joint border committees. We said, leverage these relationships to do some work on informal cross-border trade and promote improved dialogues and communication. We also thought it was important to create forums where ICBTs can discuss, receive support, identify constructive solutions to misconduct, to corruption, to gender-based violence, and, and other constraints. And a key recommendation was to address gender-based violence and harassment through rights awareness campaigns, forums, and support mechanisms, looking at informal cross-border traders. But then on the other hand, also leveraging relationships and, and activities with border agents to provide culturally sensitive training for border agents on appropriate and inappropriate behavior when interacting with ICBTs. And we thought it was really important to, to also look at the other side, not just work with women to reduce gender-based violence, but work with the border agents and use strong and clear messaging about misconduct and consequences, and then work with trade officials to make sure that there is some follow-up in terms of consequences when gender-based violence occurs. And, I, and along the lines of what Sait, Sait said earlier, you know, it's also important to make sure that there are women border agents at the borders. We also recommended working with existing national and regional ICBT associations to help form and help form new associations when, where they don't exist. This support can be administrative, logistical, technical, financial. It can also include capacity building. But we felt that working with informal cross-border trade associations can have some pretty significant advantages for women ICBTs and make it a lot easier to provide support services to a wider group of informal cross-border traders. Uh, it's a way to tap into networking and information sharing. Uh, through By working with associations, traders can have a coordinated and more effective approach to policy making and lobbying as well and, and lobby for a more conducive operating environment at the border. It's also serving on these committees um, and associations can also be a way for women to hold leadership positions. And it's really important to get women in those first leadership positions. And then using those leadership positions, they can articulate women-specific ICBT issues with stakeholders. Uh, in working with associations, sorry about that. Working with associations, uh, it's also it could be an opportunity to provide some targeted savings and loan opportunities for um, women and formal cross-border traders. As I mentioned before, access to finance was a key constraint. And so we thought that perhaps national ICBT associations could collaborate with some of the better established MFIs to develop a, micro a microcredit program that provides short-term working capital, but that's designed specifically with the flexibility to accommodate traders' uneven, uneven business cycles. In addition to these recommendations, we also thought it's important to facilitate access uh, to, of informal cross-border traders to trade fairs, skill building opportunities, cooperatives, and social safety nets. And we also thought it was important to do further research with frontline border officials. We were only able to talk to a limited number of border officials in our research and feel like this is a, another opportunity to learn more. So just as a quick wrap up before we do questions, the key takeaways is that ICBT in the African context is fluid, it's efficient, it's widespread, and it provides an income source for a huge, a huge percentage of Africa's population. Looking at women in formal cross-border traders, they're heads of households, they're responsible for children and numerous other dependents, and they have many other jobs and roles. ICBT contributes to family health, food security, housing, and it also has some pretty big benefits on women's self-esteem and respect. But ICBT also has some much bigger regional and national contributions within Southern Africa, contributing between 30 and 40 percent of SADC trade, helping to address unemployment, underemployment, and food security. But there are a lot of constraints that we need to be addressing in our development programming and working with governments and border agents to address. 
And we're hoping that a lot of our recommendations on infrastructure, communications and training, the regulatory environment, opportunities for further research and direct support will be adopted and taken up. And one thing that is exciting to announce is that we're hopefully going to be able to somewhat expand on this research um, and work with the Southern Africa Seed Trade Project to, to do a larger assessment uh, over, the next, over this next year looking at uh, women's role in the seed trade in Southern Africa. And I think that momentum to do this even larger piece of research very much came out of this research. So it's nice to see this research already leading to a more advanced conversation on women in trade and women in informal cross-border trade. So thank you. Thank you so much for these extremely important and compelling presentations. Um, a, a really important topic of conversation on International Women's Day. All right, we have about half an hour for questions, comments, Q&A. Uh, we'll take questions from both the in-person audience and from our online audience uh, joining by webinar. And feel free to direct them to um, either Liz or uh, Sage or just more generally uh, pose a question. Uh, and we also just ask that you uh, state your name and organization, if you will. So please raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll kind of alternate between the in-person and online. Uh, uh, could you clarify a bit more exactly what defines informal trade? Because you mentioned that maybe you could do that in a few hours if you were an informal trader, but you might maybe have to wait for 10 days if you were a formal trader. And... Uh, I ask partly because you, you normally think that with efficient traders you'd want to help scale them up, but if there's some kind of maximum in terms of it's only what you can carry over, whatever, obviously the definition of informal trade, uh, you know, conditions what's possible. Sure. Uh, so that's a great question. And some, so some of the definitions that we used are, were from SADC and COMESA. That's why I was looking through the report to give you the official definition. So the static definition of ICBT is any business operating in goods and services that trades across the border and that has no official export import license or permit within a defined threshold and frequency. And COMESA defines it as a form of trade that's unrecorded in official statistics and often carried out by small businesses or traders in the region. Um, and the COMESA definition is a little more problematic as it largely defines ICBT as, as somewhat criminal and there's this confusion between criminal and informal. But so our definition was a little bit more broad and it was, you know, people who were not trading. The, so the Southern Africa Trade Hub was working with formal trade, looking specifically at like big trucks and large companies that were getting goods across the border. And we were looking at more informal businesses, people who don't have a registered business and who were just doing it through a much more ad hoc approach. Just to follow up a question, I was wondering if that was actually the definition in terms of maybe, uh, you know, thinking of people getting into queues, maybe if they had some kind of truck or size of container which was larger than such and such, they had to go into one queue versus another. So I was wondering if there was some kind of volume, uh, you know, definition applied. Do you know if there's one or not? No, I don't think we applied anything based on volume, but it was, you know, it's more about the women and whether or not they had formal or informal businesses. A question from our online audience, and also let us know how many people are joining. Hello. Ah. So we have about 97 uh, participants online. Um, this, we had a few people asking about constraints. How are respective ministry offices addressing various constraints? Do these constraints exist only in the informal sector? And do men face the same constraints? Those questions come from Mary Dean Purves, Mona Shrista, and Indra Klein. All right, those are really good questions. So in looking at constraints, we found that yes, many of the constraints that we discussed are, you can apply to men and to women. The, the biggest difference is gender-based violence. And we didn't, you know, we, the, again, this was a rapid assessment. So this wasn't a, a long quantitative study, but you know, we didn't hear about gender-based violence um, happening to the male traders. 
And so I think that is one key gender difference. And you know, we found that you know, safety was just a bigger concern amongst the women formal cross-border traders. We talked to a group of women who said that they just band together and, for example, they travel to all, on all their journeys together because it means that someone is awake on the long bus rides across borders to watch over their goods, to make sure they're not being harassed, they use bathrooms together, they stay in accommodation together. And so the women seem generally more concerned about safety and have experienced gender-based violence as additional constraint. But all of the other constraints I highlighted, talking about finance, talking about lack of information, those are all applicable to women and men. And we just applied a gender context to it because that was what we were looking at in our research and also because there's such a high percentage of women who are informal cross-border traders. I think the, the question on ministries is good. And, and you know, we didn't have enough time to talk to every ministry and understand what they were doing. But we did find that a lot of the interventions that are happening are focusing more on working with informal cross-border traders. For example, putting them in associations, working to help inform them on their rights, and, and not much is being done to actually address issues that are happening with the border agents on the front lines. And that's an area, um, that's a tremendous area for further improvement and looking at some additional solutions. And so that's why we were really trying to highlight that recommendation on working with border agents, because we just found that that's not really happening by different ministries. And if I, and if I could ask a follow-up question, a follow -up question from Mona Shrista. How strong were women's networks, NGOs, in addressing these constraints? So we didn't have time to talk to a, a number of NGOs, but we, you know, we have found that NGOs are working with women in formal cross-border traders, but it's, it's not at scale. There's just a lot more that needs to be done, and a lot of the women we spoke to in our research weren't tapped into associations and not received support from different NGOs. And while there are NGOs doing programming, again, that programming is primarily working with traders and not really addressing the other side of the coin, which is the, the government officials, the infrastructure at the border, some of these bigger issues. But they are helping to raise awareness on women's rights, make sure the information is out there, form associations, form some type of almost, almost like a complaint mechanism for when in, in, incidents do happen, but it's just not happening at scale. So many of the women we spoke to had no idea that there were these services available or they weren't available at their respective borders. The ministries question um, that I think there's significant opportunities, especially in light of this type of research, to um, show off the findings to the ministries. And I mean, you know, ministry um, uh, could, for instance, um, uh, resolve to hire more women at a border. And uh, from a research perspective, I'd love to see an experiment where you had all women border agents at a border and how it changed the trade flows. Um, I think that. You know, if, if we had the research to show to a government to say, hey, this is an easy, potentially easy change that you could implement. Because, um, you know, also, I don't know about the employment statistics. How many people actually work at a border? You know, probably formally less than 100. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's something to consider as, as people that interact with governments and ministries. Closer. There we go. Uh, my name is Melissa. I work with Lloyd Advisors. Uh, I tend to work a lot in agriculture and looking at the kind of pipeline from the informal to formal trade. Uh, I think it's great that how you pointed out that there's a scale limitation. It's not really advantageous for a lot of folks to move up into that formal market. And although the scale is different, a lot of the constraints faced in the informal and formal market are quite similar. Um, have you heard of or worked with anybody that's kind of looking across trade together? I'm curious because I'm wondering if we reduce some of the constraints in formal trade, how it could have some positive effect in the informal trade. So what we found in our limited research for this rapid assessment is that there just isn't that much being done on women in informal cross-border trade. and like specifically informal cross-border trade. Um, you know, there's a lot of work being done working with informal women-owned businesses and entrepreneurs, but not really looking at this issue through a trade lens. And we tried, one of the things we wanted to do in our research was this big best practices review of what was happening and what others were doing and then recommend these best practices. And that 
couldn't really find those best practices. So I think it's actually a tremendous gap in programming. On training and re-education, uh, we have some questions from Indra Klein. With regard to borders where majority uh, are where the majority are men, what steps are being taken to re-educate agencies uh, for male representatives to respectfully acknowledge and treat women? Um, many times that involves addressing cultural systems that are in place. And kind of on that same question, with regards to training, is there corrective action? such as fines or removal from position? So those are great questions. And, and what we found is there really is no training happening right now working with the border agents. I, I think maybe about three and a half years ago, I went to a regional conference in Southern Africa on informal cross-border trade. And as I mentioned, everyone's working. And anyone who's doing any programming in this area, they're working with the traders. No one is doing any work to work with border agents to be more respectful, to reduce gender-based violence, to better understand the constraints that women in formal cross-border traders encounter. And, and that's why in our recommendations, I repeatedly highlighted this. And I think opportunities like the current Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub and perhaps some of the other USA trade hubs just have this tremendous opportunity because if they're already working with border agents and officials, this is just an easy, way to, to leverage those existing connections. Maybe not easy, but it's a way to leverage those existing connections and finally provide that training, because that training is not happening. Um, and in terms of corrective action, I mean, the women that we talk to, they're not even seeking corrective action because they accept it as this reality. They just say, this is the cost of doing business, and I, I want to be able to keep feeding my family, so I'll keep letting this happen. And so, you know, I think we also have a lot of work to do in terms of promoting greater awareness that, no, this isn't okay. But, you know, when, if a woman has to deal with, you know, losing her entire day's um, work, losing her entire, you know, all, everything she's purchased for the day, all of that labor and that effort that's involved in crossing the border, getting these goods that she's going to sell at the end of the day to feed her family, and it's, she's torn between, you know, sexual coercion and losing those purchases, she's going to choose what's what means providing for her family. And that's really the only option available to a lot of these women at this point. On the culture uh, piece, that's a really important observation. I mean, in a lot of these countries, it's just culturally acceptable um, to say that men are better than women. Men are uh, deserve more rights than women. And, and so I think it requires a lot of um, nuance when dealing with government <laughs> officials on this topic. Um, you know, because just charging in and saying, you know, uh, you guys are treating your women poorly and you need to change, it's not always the best way to, to do it. And on, in cases like that, accountability is, is the best way to go. And um, on the World Bank project that I mentioned that has the credible complaint mechanism, um, again, I'm, I'm curious to see whether that has worked, just because you know, oftentimes you have these toll-free lines that after a month, no one's picking up the phone. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious to see whether that has worked and, and I'll uh, report back to you if you give me your name and email. As a follow-up to that question very quickly, from Carmine Soprano, who's a cross-border trade specialist at the World Bank, what incentive mechanisms would you recommend to introduce at the border to reduce corruption and improve officials' behavior? This is just a statement. Many of them do acknowledge the importance of cross-border trade and the challenges this presents. They would also object that bribes are often their main sources of livelihoods due to very low salary levels and poor working conditions. Well, first of all, I'm not necessarily going to answer that question, but Carmine Spino is a World Bank person that I've been trying to get in touch with who I, might be in East Africa. So if he can answer the question about whether um, that uh, complaint mechanism is working, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> Do you want to try it? No, good. Uh, OK. So, yeah, I mean, I think these are all really valid points that Carmine raises. And one of the things that we wa would have liked to have done with the Southern Africa Trade Hub if there had been more time was the Southern Africa Trade Hub was creating these joint border committees where you could coordinate with the different um, national borders and talk about issues and, and really leveraging these border associations and committees. And 
using these existing networks and these um, existing convenings to have some opportunities to talk about issues with informal cross-border trade and get informal cross-border traders in the room and get, you know, people who have really had, op had an opportunity to think about and formulate their requests and talk a little bit about, you know, these are the constraints we encounter, this is where we're coming from, just to promote better understanding between the two sides because clearly right now there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of a breakdown in communication, there's abuse happening, and we thought the first step is let's create a dialogue, let's create a conversation and try to promote a more mutual understanding. I think State's point, about you know also trying to make sure that there are women at, at border posts is also something that's definitely worth highlighting and emphasizing is you know women can then also be check up on bad behavior like gender based violence and then you know obviously let's pay the border officials more so that they're not as reliant on corruption but that is also a huge that's a that's huge thing that's a really important point on the salaries issue I mean, I'm an economist, and so, you know, why do people take bribes? It's not, you know, not because they're necessarily just bad people. They need to feed their families as well. And when your salary is $60 a month, um, which is a lot less than one, what these traders earn, um, that's a problem. And so, you know, I, I appreciate that nuance and thinking more critically and, and deeply about the full uh, um, political economy of what happens at borders. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll take a couple from the room. Uh, so I saw a few hands over here. Um, hi, my name is Jennifer with, with Heifer, and I have a question about the methodology. Um, just to clarify that I understood this correctly, if I understood, Liz, most of your um, desk research was you were citing reports that I think were for all over Africa, is that correct? And then your research was just in Southern Africa, is that right? So I'm wondering if you found any um, kind of discrepancies or anything that you noted that was different in the pan-African research as opposed to your your research that I know was fairly quick that you were able to do, um, if you found anything, any real differences that were worth highlighting. Um, and also, who is hearing these recommendations officially and formally that you're providing? Thanks. Sure. So we'll start with your last question, who's hearing these recommendations. And one thing that USAID has been really great about is sharing this information throughout the agency. So back in November, USAID had a, an advanced trade facilitation workshop where, uh, I mean, how many people was, was it say? Like 30, 40. Yeah, like 40 people from agencies all around the world came together for a week-long training on trade facilitation, and we presented on this research at that, at that workshop. We also did an interagency brown bag back um, I don't know, it was almost a, like six or seven months ago at this point where we talked about the research specifically looking at infrastructure and gender-based violence. And then the Africa Bureau did a seminar where we also presented on this research. And in addition to that, we did a presentation on this research to the um, Department of Agriculture, Foreign Agricultural Services as well. So trying to um, bring this out to other uh, United States agencies and say that this is relevant to their work as well. So I think that we've done a really great job sharing this within USAID and getting attention with, within USAID. And so now, and I think this was the goal of having this Microlinks AgriLinks webinar, was to now start disseminating it to a wider population and, and getting the information out beyond USAID. So because we know it can have, you know, it can, it could potentially inform many other programs outside of the USAID space, but also more at the implementation level. And then. Um, remind me of your first question, sorry. So the other, the other part of the question is just that you were citing okay. studies that are all of Africa, but your research was just Southern Africa. So I guess highlighting any differences mm -hmm. or anything that would be useful for us to know. Yeah, we didn't really find anything that was so different. I mean, a lot of the research out there is a little bit outdated, and so we, we have to take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. But there was, I think there was nothing that we said, oh, this is really different from the more general research out there. We'll take another question from here in the room. Hi, I'm Megan. I work with the Feed the Future Enabling Environment for Food Security Project with USAID. Um, uh, so I work on the project not with USAID, but uh, it's funded by USAID. Um, I was really struck by kind of a, a high level takeaway from your presentations, which is the importance when we're consuming information about the impacts of 
trade and the rules and regulations that come along with it, the importance of really understanding is that data or is that information really including the informal sector or not? Because there can that there's a lot of good intentions around changes around trade, and people aren't always aware of um, the impacts that they have on the informal side for a lot of um, very real reasons. The data around the informal sector is much harder to get in the hands of decision makers who are trying to make positive change in terms of rules and regulations. Um, so my question to you really is if you see a role either in your research um, or in other research you've come across um, around how can we look at the informal sector and get that information to decision makers. Um, because we know there's a lot of challenges around formal data and, and data that captures the formal sector. So there's a lot of data challenges around that. How do we kind of close the gap and make informal data around trade as well as around women and trade more accessible to those decision makers? Um, so. Okay. Okay. so I think one opportunity is is obviously doing events like this. I mean, we saw, um, you know, with the, the Sea Trade Project, which is also another regional trade project, that they, they saw this research and they said, we want to have research on women's role in the sea trade, both informal and formal. And they've specifically asked for research that doesn't just look at the formal sea trade, but the informal sea trade as well. So it's great that we're already seeing, you know, the, the little, like, genderometer moving a little bit forward, inching forward because of this first report. And they're saying, oh, we, we might need to consider how women are involved in our seed value chain and, and trade. And so that's that's a great first step. And I but I also think that donors like USAID, like the World Bank, have a tremendous role to play in this area because I'm also an implementer and implementers are going to really struggle to look at informal cross-border trade and other gender issues if that's not in the scope of work, if that's not in the contract, if that's not, if the COR is not asking for that. And so I think there's definitely an onus on the donor and on USA to say, we want you to look at both informal and formal trade or informal and formal economies. You know, for example, the scope of work for the Southern Africa Trade Project and the, you know, the components of the project Informal trade was not written into that project at all. It was formal trade, looking at big trucks crossing borders, let's speed up the time for those trucks to get across the borders. And we really had to push to get this research done on informal cross-border trade. And we were really lucky that we had some champions in the project who said, we're at the borders every day. We see these informal cross-border traders. So even though this isn't like you know, a slam dunk in terms of its connection to formal trade, we value the research and think it would be informative to the work we're doing. But if you had had a few people who just weren't champions of this work, it never would have it never would have happened. So it's highlighting the data as well. I mean, um, understanding the macroeconomics behind informal cross-border trade and disseminating that information. And like Liz said, we've uh, been trying quite hard to do that at USAID, um, and it's, I think it's been quite successful actually. Um, so uh, infusing you know project material with the appropriate gender. Um, uh, uh, asks, I, I think, is a good first step. I think also qualitative data is often overlooked. Um, there's a natural bias towards quantitative data, and I think in a field like informal cross-border trade, that's something that um, is not necessarily best suited to quantitative data just because it's hard to identify. And so that's part of why we really like this research on this report is the granularity it gives us and the, the face that it gives us uh, of informal cross-border traders. And, and also, I, I like, quite like the psychological aspects to this of looking at how um, this type of assistance affects women's self-esteem, for instance, or dealing with the psychology of, um, of uh, border agents, you know, talking to them and paying attention to them and trying to figure out how to make them change their behavior. I mean, this research was very much to me like the little engine that could. It almost didn't happen. It happened at the very end. It was very scrappy. But I think the fact that we've been presenting on it so much, and this is all demand-driven by USAID, shows that that this is something that USAID wants to invest in further. And I think that's really encouraging. And hopefully, maybe we will see 
more of a focus on informal trade in some of these trade projects. And I do, I think I recall the Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub solicitation did have informal cross-border trade built into that solicitation somewhat, whereas the, the Southern Africa Trade Hub, the, the prior project that this research was done under, didn't have any role for informal cross-border trade. So already you see a shift, slight shift. Thank you. Um, I think we have about uh, five minutes left, so probably time for one more online and one more in-person question. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you all to please fill out the surveys that were on your chairs. Uh, they just help us you know, get a gauge on how well these events uh, are coming across, what, what sort of value they bring to you, and um, you know, help improve them for the future. So you can just leave them on your chairs or drop them at the table on your way out. Um, all right, so do we have one more online question? Yeah, we do. Um, this comes from a bunch of folks, including Lucas Baracke, Mona Shrista, Angela Caporelli, and Daniela De Franco. Um, what proportion of the women in informal cross-border trade that you interviewed are married? Um, could their marital status influence their participation in this kind of trade? Um, and then general questions about socio-demographic uh, differences. Are any of them from polygamous families? Great questions. And unfortunately, because this was a rapid assessment with only two weeks of field research, it was originally envisioned as being you know, three times that amount of field research time. We weren't able to get into issues of polygamy, but I think that's really interesting. I think we found that um, I can't give you a statistic again because this was a rapid assessment, but you know, many of the women were married, but they, they told us over and over again that they felt because they were bringing income into their families, their husbands respected that, and they were able to make improved decision making. They had improved decision making within their households with their husbands because they were bringing income to the family. So that's feedback we got specifically from women who had husbands saying, we have a, we have a, a higher decision making role in the household because of this income. But there were a lot of other women we spoke to who were um, de facto or de jour head of households because they were single, divorced, their husbands had died, or their husbands were away. So I can't give a number, but we did make sure to talk to women who were married and had their husbands present and those who were not married for different reasons. All right, one more hand I see in the back. This will be our last question for the day. All right, here you go. Hello, I'm Emily from the Grameen Foundation, and I was just wondering about um, whether the women talked about the safety risks of carrying cash across the border, and whether any of them were using any kind of digital payments, or talked about the need for that as a way to facilitate their livelihoods. That's a great question, and women commonly talked about theft of both the goods they were trading uh, and exchanging for, as well as theft of the cash. And they said that was something to look out for in crowded accommodation, that was something to look out for in transportation, and, and also in markets when they were selling their goods. And they, many of them complained about this as a serious issue. And for that, I, I highlighted earlier the safety in numbers, where you found women in formal cross-border traders traveling together, going to the bathroom together, uh, going through long bus rides together, because they felt someone could always stay awake and alert and help reduce this risk of theft. Women talked about lack of banking facilities, but no one um, talked about having mobile bank accounts. And it seemed that most women were accessing only informal savings mechanisms. So it seems like they have not really had access to these mobile banking opportunities. But that would also potentially be an area for further investment. I think that's also um, an area uh, that's interesting from a cross-border regulatory perspective. If you know, I'm not sure uh, about the statistics of this, but I'm guessing that you know, in-country mobile payments are a lot higher than cross-border uh, mobile payments. And you know, just getting officials to regulatory officials to think about how building similar um, mobile banking infrastructure in one country and the other regionally might translate to lower attacks on women at the border, trying to cross borders. Um, so I, th I think that's an example of an implication that might seem far-fetched, but really isn't. Great. Well, thank you so much to Liz and Sate for your excellent presentations and very deft answering of questions. Uh, thank you to the KDAD project for making these events happen. And most importantly, thank you to you for attending, both online and in person. 
uh, and for always sharing your feedback, um, asking great questions, and also helping make these events happen. Uh, so on behalf of Microlinks and Agrilinks, thank you, and we'll see you in the future.